Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. Hi. Hallelujah. <laughs> On behalf of Mark, Alice, and myself, I want to greet you in the wonderful, precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, as we continue on in our look at the Sermon on the Mount. That's where we've been studying for yes, quite a number of weeks now, which is the basic training for Christianity. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to look at... We're going to look at the statements that Jesus made in Matthew chapter 5, and he made it repeatedly. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Right? He said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. I want to talk about where they had heard it said. Okay? Okay. Because they didn't hear it from him. No. They didn't hear it from the Father. They didn't hear it from the Holy Spirit. No. Because he wasn't changing his mind about anything. No. God doesn't do that. All right? So... I, want to, I have a starting point for this, and the starting point is not in Matthew, but in the prophet Zephaniah. Okay. So if you'll turn to the prophet Zephaniah in the first chapter, I'm going to read the 8th and the 12th verses. It says in verse 8, Then it will come about on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, that I will punish the princes, the king's sons, and all who clothe themselves with foreign garments. In verse 12 it says, It will come about at that time, that I will search Jerusalem with lamps, and I will punish the men who are stagnant in spirit, who say in their hearts, the Lord will not do good or evil. The first part of that, he talks about foreign garments. Now, in the King James Version, it says strange garments. And I, I really think that's a better translation by far. It says in Ephesians 4, what are you supposed to be clothed in? What are you supposed to be clothed in? In Ephesians 4, verse 23 and 24, it says, Paul wrote, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. you got to put on the new self. And then later on in Ephesians, Paul said, put on the full armor, the whole armor of God, so you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So you're supposed to be wearing that whole armor of God. That's how you're supposed to be clothed. And in Colossians, Colossians 3.14, he said, Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. So you're supposed to be wearing the new self. You're supposed to be wearing the full armor of God. You're supposed to be clothed with love. But in Romans 13.14, I think key is, Paul said, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's how we're supposed to be clothed, right? If we're to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, who is life, then there is no more strange or foreign garment than those of death for a Christian. Are there garments of death? Yes, there are. Yes, there are. We're going to talk about that. Many talked about being stagnant in spirit. The King James says, settled on their leaves. What it's talking about is being complacent, all right? Um, settled, complacent, hardened in their habits. Now, I want you to keep that phrase in mind, hardened in their habits, right? Which brings us, of course, to the empty tomb. Yes. Now, if I talk to you about, you know, the resurrection of, you know, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and I mention the empty tomb, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? Mm -mm -mm. Do you really? No, 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 because no. the tomb was certainly not empty. That's right. Tomb was not empty. You know, it says when Mary Magdalene and perhaps another or more women went to the tomb after Jesus had been buried and they found the stone rolled away, they thought, she thought, that they, they being either the Roman soldiers or somebody, uh, had a plot and that they had stolen, taken away the body of Jesus. So she ran and came to Peter and John and she told them. So now in John chapter 20, I want to read this. John chapter 20, starting in verse 3. It says, so Peter and the other disciple, that's John, went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran ahead faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. And stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. And so Peter also came and following him and entered the tomb and he saw the linen wrappings lying there and the face cloth, which had been on his head, not lying with linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. So the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. 
Well, you know, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy and said, all scripture is God-breathed. Every word has, has purpose. It's God's breath that gives life. It's profitable, he said, for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So it's not without purpose that God specifically mentions and makes such an issue of this right. that when they went into the tomb, they found these garments of death. They found the burial clothing, right? right. This is important. The tomb was not empty. The burial clothes, the garments of death were left behind when Jesus walked out. Now contrast that with an event that had taken place not much be long, long, not long before that. The resurrection of Lazarus. Coming to the tomb where Lazarus had been lying for four days, it says in John chapter 11, I'm going to read from verse 39. Jesus said, remove the stone. He came to the tomb and he says, remove the stone. It was in front, right? Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench, for he has been dead four days. And Jesus said to her, did I not say to you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they removed the stone. Then Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus. Then he said, come forth. The man who had died came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. You see, unlike Jesus, but like us, Lazarus came into new life, came out of death, came out of that tomb, into new life, clothed with the old garments of death, the old habits, the old traditions, the old ways of thinking. So Lazarus, as Lazarus came out of that tomb, the very first thing that Jesus says to the believers around, that's the church, the very first thing he says is unbind him. You see, the Apostle Paul, after recounting his life history as a Pharisee, a Pharisee, a, he says a Pharisee, you know, of the Pharisees, a son, he was a son of a Pharisee, and one who was extremely zealous for his ancestral tradition, proclaimed that we are to be renewed by the transforming of our minds. And as always, he lived what he preached. He says in Philippians chapter 3, he says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards a goal for the prize of the upper call of God. I mean, this man knew the traditions of the elders, and that's what we're going to talk about, what that ex exactly that is. Because this is what Jesus is meaning when he says, you've heard it, you've heard it said. Right. He wasn't talking about what they had heard in the Word of God. It was the traditions of the elders, the tradition of the fathers. Okay? Let's just have a look at that, okay? In Mark okay. chapter 7, I'm going to read from Mark chapter 7, Mark. Okay. <laughs> Starting in verse 1. It says, the Pharisees... And some of the scribes gathered around him, Jesus, when they had come from Jerusalem and had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your, your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you, you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines, the precepts of men. Neglecting the camp commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. You see, he's not talking about what they had heard in the law and the commandments in the law, but what was added to that as the tradition of 
The elders. The tra tradition of the elders. The elders are the ones that wrote the Talmud. Yes, these are the these are the rabbis. Right. Okay. The tradition of the elders in in Judaism. And I asked you this before. You know what it's called? The tradition of the elders basically is the Talmud. The Talmud from the time of the Babylonian captivity and into New Testament times. These were not. These were, these were commentaries on the scripture, but far more than commentaries, they were additions to the scriptures. They were, what they said was like filling in the gaps, okay? Now, I'm not making this up. I want to read to you from the Jewish Virtual Library, because that document, speaking of the, of the Talmud, states that common sense, this is a quote from them, trust me, I don't, this is not, not in agreement with this. Common sense suggests that some sort of oral tradition was always needed to accompany the written law because the Torah alone, even with its 613 commandments, is insufficient an insufficient guide to Jewish life. The Bible was insufficient. They were saying that the, the word of God that they had received was insufficient to guide life. All right? Now, you know, Peter... A Jew, raised Jewish, right? He had said, we have been given, and he's talking about the word, we have been given everything pertaining to life and godliness. Right. You see, and, and Jewish scripture had made it clear that God's word, and not the teachers, is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 119, one, verse 105. And we surely know now that while God appoints teachers in the church, it's the Holy Spirit that was sent to lead us into all truth. So, it's really important to get this, that in the Jewish religion, this Talmud became more important than the Scriptures. Because it was saying, okay, what we're doing is we're telling you how to live the Scriptures. But that became their law. So, like, in, you know, in the account of the man who had been born blind, in John chapter 9, when the Pharisees are testing the man who had been healed by Jesus and given his sight back, and they said, we know, speaking of Jesus, they said, we know that this man is a sinner. How did they know Jesus was a sinner? Because he broke the traditions. He never broke the law. Never, ever. But they couldn't distinguish between their traditions and the commandments of God. Thus Jesus said, how nicely you set aside the commandments of God to hold fast to your traditions, right? Mm -hmm. This is really, really important. Because the Word of God clearly says, do not add or take away from the Word. And yet that's exactly what this is doing. Now commentaries aren't bad. As long as you don't become somebody who relies on the commentary rather than the Word. The purpose, it supersedes the right, word. the purpose of, the, of a commentary... The purpose of a teaching is to bring you into a clearer understanding of the Word because it's the Word that guides your life. It is the Word that's a, a light and a lamp, all right? Absolutely. Yeah, I, don't, I don't ever want you to go out and say, well, you know, He says. No, go out and say the Word says, the Lord says. That's, that's what matters in life. Now, can that happen in a church? I mean, it happened in, it happened in Judaism. It certainly happened. It dominates Ju Judaism, mm -hmm. that Talmud. Yes, it can happen. Yes, it does happen. How it says, yes, it can happen. Yes, it does happen. You know, half of the people in the world that call themselves Christians are Roman Catholic. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, I want to tell you this. I was raised Roman Catholic. Okay. As we all were. All, all three all of us were. Mm -hmm. I did graduate work in a, in a Catholic seminary in sacramental theology and Old Testament studies. Mm -hmm. Okay? So I have, I, what I'm saying is not just you know, some off-the-wall opinion. I mean, this is stuff that I studied. Mm -hmm. But I want to read to you from the Roman Catholic Catechism, something, you know, that's uh, right out of the Vatican here. Sacred tradition and sacred scripture, then, are bound closely together and communicate one with the other, for both of them, flowing out from the same divine wellspring, come together in some fashion to form one thing. So they're saying... The tradition, which, by the way, you notice always comes first. Yes. Tradition and scripture become one. You can't separate them. Keep that in mind. 
And then they, but they go on in the next paragraph and say, holy tradition transmits in its entirety the word of God. So they're saying, you know, they're not equal no. because it's tradition that gives you the whole truth is what they're saying. Scripture only gives you a part of the truth, which is basically what, exactly what happened with the Talmud. They were saying, you know, what, what was transmitted, the Word of God from Genesis to Malachi, that's not, that wasn't communicating what God wanted you to know. Okay? And then in the next paragraph it says, as a result, the church to whom the transmission and interpretation of Revelation is entrusted does not derive her certainty about all revealed truth from Holy Scriptures alone. What they are saying is the church can't come to a knowledge of the truth through Scripture. That's exactly what that says. They need the priest to interpret it. And they need tradition is what they're saying. Yes. In order to understand what God wants, you can't depend on the Word of God. You have to have tradition. Okay. In, now, remember what I think about what I just said, right? In the light of tradition, it says... These traditions can be retained, modified, or even abandoned under the guidance of the church's magisterium. So they're saying that it's a tradition that gives you the fullness of God, what God wants. But that can be modified, it can be, it can be retained, it can be abandoned. But you, wait a minute, God's word can't be changed. No, it cannot. If, if tradition is more important than God's word, then... How can it be changed more often than God's word? It should, God's word should, should be set changed. in stone no. as much as God's word is. What they're saying is not. It's not because uh, look, listen. It should it's be crazy. honest. If you if, if you know anything, tradition changes constantly. Yeah, traditions yes. change, yes. and it changes with boundaries. Yeah. But the but the word of God does not change. No. All right. You go to so, another country, it changes. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God remains forever. All right. Jesus Christ is the Word of God, and He is the same yesterday, today, and yes, forever. So it's unchangeable. And yet they're saying, and by the way, I, this is simply because a fact. Because it's perfect. Why would it have to change? Well, it's perfect. One the of the things is, is you have to understand is, when if, I'm going to put if here, if tradition and scripture conflict, yes. which they frequently, frequently, they will. frequently, yes. frequently, often, and how do I can emphasize that more, often do, they say that tradition supersedes. supersedes scripture. Wrong. Absolutely wrong. But that's what's going on in the church. And you, I can sit here. Well, let me just read a couple more. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the Word of God, this is the catechism of the Catholic Church, whether it's in its written form or in the form of tradition, has been entrusted to the living teaching office of the church alone. In other words... Only the, the magisterium, only the officials of the church mm -hmm. can interpret and understand Scripture. Mm -hmm. That's the teaching of the church. It has been the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church for as long as the Roman Catholic Church has existed. And that didn't start with Peter. Yeah. Huh. And it's still the same today. All right. The task of interpreting the Word of God authentically has been entrusted solely to the magisterium of the church. That is to the Pope and to the bishops in communion with him. Now, I've, I mean, this is something I've encountered. I've been teaching the Word for 40 years. And during that time, much of it has been in, in a context of a Catholic setting. And in one place where I was doing it, they finally they sent in a priest and said he had to be there to interpret Scripture. Yeah. Because being a layman, I couldn't understand. He, what, he, they literally believe I didn't have the power, the ability, to be able to understand Scripture. They must have missed part of Scripture. And the part of Scripture is that Jesus said that when he went, he would send the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. The Holy Spirit of which of whom I am a temple. That's right. And that Holy us. Spirit would lead us, lead me into all truth. That's right. Okay? You have the ability to know all truth. Yes. It comes from abiding, not in tradition, in but Jesus word. said, if you abide in my word, you shall know you're truly truth. my disciples. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free from what? Traditions. The traditions of oh, men. Yeah. That's what it'll set you free from. You it, get unbound. One of the traditions up. was super, was, um, was 
uh, it was in it was in the Bible, and Paul is always talking about it. Uh, <coughs> Got me a little share. Uh, I forget the word. Um, It'll come to you. Okay, yeah. it comes to okay. you. Um, the, the the problem is well, Paul is the one. Now remember, he said, "As I was advancing in Judaism, beyond many of my contemporaries among my countrymen, being more more extremely zealous." from my ancestral traditions. Galatians 1.14. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He was a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. Yes. I mean, go read Philippians chapter 3 and see the context of this whole thing is talking about how he was raised, how he was, he, he was just imbued. He was uh, just totally Saturated. engrossed yeah. in what? In the tradition of, of, the Judy, of the Jews. Cir circumcision. I mean, they that, that that is an ongoing. That is like the pinnacle of their law, and uh, Peter and Paul had to figure this out over and over again. But, but see, the answer is in the law. Yeah, yeah. you don't have to wait a minute. You don't you don't have to go into it because it says in Deuteronomy that we're to circumcise the foreskin of your hearts. Yes, that's what it says. So it's more. You see, this is like what I talked about with Lazarus. You know, when he came out, he still, he, there's the, the picture of a new life inside and the garments of death on the outside. You, you know, we are to, and Paul talks about this, how we are to live according to the spirit of the word, not the letter. Because the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. Okay? So it, the problem is when they don't understand what the word means, then they'll make something up. Lean on their own understanding. And lean on their own understanding. That's what it takes to get tradition, is to lean on your own understanding. Which the Word of God says, don't you do. Don't do it. Get you Proverbs 3.5. Absolutely. So, um, you know, when Alice and I spent two years traveling back in the, uh, the early 80s. Yeah, early 80s. Mm -hmm. And we traveled around the country. I had We had a motorhome, a bus motorhome that we had converted. And just teaching wherever the Lord led us. And we one of the stops, one of the places we spent a fair amount of time, was in western Kentucky. We wound up in Murray, Kentucky. And there's a state college there in Murray. And somebody had opened their home and we were doing, I was doing Bible studies almost every night or quite a number of times every week. And we had a lot of people coming to these Bible studies and we had people, some young people coming from the college. And one of them was a, a, just a dear, dear sister, I mean, who's been involved in our life for years. Since then. Since then. Her name was Susan. And she came in and she would sit there and in the beginning it was like she'd sit the, at the Bible study and she'd kind of twitch. And one night I was teaching something and she just jumped up and ran out the door. I mean, just it was like shocking. I mean, just she just bounded up and ran out the door. So we didn't see her for a few days. And then after a few days, she came back. And she said that what she had learned, because she was raised in a Christian home, in a, in a Christian de denomination, and she said the things that she had learned had been like a wall, a brick wall that had built in front of her. And as she was sitting there listening to the Bible studies, it was like I would say something and a, and a brick would come out of that wall. I'd say, and then, by the way, my saying something is not my commentary, it was something word. out of the Word, right. and it would take another brick out of that wall. Superseded and she, the traditions. Yes, yeah, it superseded the traditions that she had learned. And this one night, she said, I said something, and the wall collapsed. Mm -hmm. She didn't know what to do. And it shook her. I mean, this is, I guess she must have been about 21 years old yeah. at the time, right? Yeah. So it just shook her, and she ran off. And she said, well, she went away, and she prayed, because she didn't know what else to do. She prayed, and she said, the Lord said, I just set you free. Yes. Free from what? The, the traditions. Yes. Free to live the Word of God. Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We, God's promise to us is that he will lead us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. How does he lead us? He leads us with his word, which is pure and holy. And Susan described it as a wall, but actually it was the death garment. That was it was a garment of death. And it can be as solid as bricks, I'm telling you what. Absolutely. But, but she had that because... The church today, and I'm going to make this statement boldly, is guided in its beliefs and its practices 
more by the tradition of men than by the word of God. Just like the Pharisees that were so ready to condemn. State that Jesus was a sinner. I, let me ask you a question. I mean, stop and think about this. As I said, you know, we have been blessed to have had the opportunity. I have preached and taught in probably 25 different denominations. Roughly, I'd, I'd say that's a, a fairly ac that's got to be an accurate number. On five different continents, and countries around the world. I mean, I've been to a lot of churches. I've seen a lot of different churches. Are they guided by the tradition or by the word? Well, I can walk into most churches and I know exactly what I, what I can expect to find. Yeah, they, they all have the, the same outline. The first, first gets up the, the worship group, which is not worship, by the way. Check your scriptures. And they'll, they'll sing a few songs, everybody have a night. And there's nothing wrong with singing. I mean, praise God for that. God has given us that and called for it. That's not worship, but, that's, but that'll take place. And then after that, there'll be announcements. They'll take up the collection, the offering. And then the pastor or whoever is speaking will get up and speak. I mean, it goes through the same ritualistic pattern that, by the way, can't be found in Scripture. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That pattern is not there, but it'll be the same thing. Or you can go to the mainline churches in their tradition, and you will see the same exact exactly. pattern week yep. after week after week after week. But do me a favor. If you love the Lord and you love the Word of God, go look and see what it's supposed to look like when we believers come together. And maybe you'll find it shocking that when it's, God's pattern for this is different than what we're practicing. And if it's different, the word is different than it's man's tradition that we are practicing. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go on and on and on, maybe, maybe just a little. One of, the, one of the quote unquote holiest days in the Christian calendar, and one that consumes a good part of the year for, for most churches, is Christmas. Now, I want to tell you that we have probably at least 60 years of church history in the New Testament from the time after the death, burial, and resurrection, the ascension of Jesus Christ, until that last letter was written on the island of Patmos by John. All right? That's about 60 years. Can you go in there and find any place where it talks about how the church came together once a year to celebrate the birth of Christ? No. No, you cannot. Be honest with yourself. So then, is it does it come from the Word of God, or does it come from some tradition? It's tradition. It's tradition. Mm -hmm. So you can say, well, that's a good tradition. Well, discuss that with the Lord. That's all I ask. Discuss it with the Lord. Yes. And there are a lot more like that. And we'll probably get into some of those in the next program. But until then, I just want to thank you, Father, for your Word. Your word made flesh who dwelt among us. Your word who is unchanging. For your spirit that you have sent to lead us into all truth, Lord God. I thank you for that truth. I thank you that you have set us free from death and the trappings of death. Lord, help us to walk in the fullness of that new life. Help us truly, Lord God, to put on your son, Jesus Christ, and to walk in love. We just bless you and praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Well, Thank you, until next time, when we get together once again, God bless you and goodbye. Don't forget to write to us. Bye-bye. <laughs>